90 miles. Right, right. All right, so if you're, if you're 90 mi- more than 90 miles away, uh, then you will be getting a stipend or you have to pick up your product from the... If you're more than 90 the... miles away, you'll, have, you'll get a stipend. Okay, if okay. Out of state, we have students in California, Virginia, um, New Mexico, Arizona, somewhere in El Paso, somewhere in, in Dallas, somewhere in Houston. So those who live uh, out of the boundaries of 90 miles, we we'll get a stipend, but if you live close within 90 miles, you will not get a stipend. You'll get to uh, come pick up your product on campus. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chef. Okay. And those of you guys who weren't here uh, last couple of days or last week at all, this uh, this is your first day of lecture. I hope you guys can go back and catch up on your reading of all the slides that I loaded up on the portal, like I was telling you guys earlier last week, trying to communicate with you guys. Okay. All the slides for last week have been uploaded to the portal for you guys to go over and read. Also, some links to some videos for the technique. I even shot some videos through text for you guys to catch up on. Okay. Um, that makeup work is due uh, hopefully sooner than later, but I will give you until week five. If that makeup work is not turned in, your grade will be, will be as is. Okay. Somebody asked me, why am I getting 40? Well, it's hard to give you, uh, give you what you deserve because of the, um, the uh, inclement weather. And that's the highest, the highest you can get considering, okay? Moving forward, for those of you guys who were not here last week, and this is your first day, um, do note that I went over the grading and the expectations. And one of the things that I emphasize on, if your camera is not on, you are forfeiting those 25 points of uniform. So, Week six come around, you look at your grade and, and it looks like you, what you're not expected. You're going to ask me why you got such a low score. Well, take a look at your grading. Were you, was your camera on? Was your uniform on? Was your hat on? So on, for, so, so for and so on. Okay. If you want to forfeit the 25 points, it's up to you. Okay. All right, cool. So I guess everybody's forfeiting the 25 points. It's all right with me. Okay. All right, let's get started. Let's take a look at the uh, newsletter. Okay. How you doing, Mr. Jaden? Welcome back. All right, so let's go take a look at the newsletter and see what's happening this week, all right? <clears throat> Let me adjust here the uh, screen, okay? Every Monday, like clockwork, we will be going, okay? over the, the newsletter every Monday, okay? There's some important info you guys need to know, okay? So let's see what's happening today in this Newsweek letter, okay? Uh, important notice, please guys, check your uh, Escobar email on a daily basis. This is where you will receive important info that you must take care of or pay close attention to. Not your school email. I mean, not your personal email, sorry, your school email. When you submit your product through email, not your personal email, your school email, okay? Utilize your school email at all times, okay? All right, let's take a look, see what else is happening, okay? Uh, Chef Series presents Chef Brian David Scott. American celebrity coffee chef and luxury coffee specialist. Coffee roaster of the year 2015 through 2017. Celebrity chef ambassador for KitchenAid, Lodge, uh, Chef Works, Wholesome, and many more. Uh, on March 2nd at 3.15 p.m. Uh, that was going to, on that, when that comes around, okay, next week, Tuesday, uh, we're going to be on production, okay. Anyways, uh, hopefully they'll record it so we can watch. The, you guys are interested. Watch the video, what he does, what he says. Okay. Again, that's your holiday calendar. Okay, guys. So don't forget, uh, March 26th, no class. That's in service. I believe somewhere around that time is going to be your last day of campus. I mean, of this block. Okay. Spring break. Coming around the corner, March 29th or April 2nd, you get a whole week off, spring break. Yeah, I don't know what we'll do, right? 
And if you have uh, changed your address and or your phone number, please update it. And that's the website link. If anybody needs it, I'll share it with you guys in the link on the uh, chat. Okay. Uh, you log in and then apply your changes if you have any. Okay. What else? Uh, so local resources, if you need assistance. And again, a uh, website to help with mental illness. Okay. Uh, another, another website, you happen to have a loss of a loved one. Those of you guys who are on the stipend program online, again, if you live within 90 miles, uh, March 1st, next Monday, or coming to the Young's Week, you will not get a stipend for um, uh, online shopping. You need to come to campus and pick a new product. But if you live out of the 90 mile radius, T Vargas is the one you should have set up your bank mobile with and correlate with your bank account. Mary Reardon is the one that sends the um, stipend okay, for the following week. Keep that info coming. Uh, keep up that info, the contact info, because again, there'll be some snafu with your bank, the website, whatever in case it may be. You may need to reach out to these two individuals just in case you do not receive your stipend. Okay. Uh, Zoom uh, send desk that phone number if you cannot have access to your portal. Okay. Or the or the email address who to contact if you have no access to your portal. I hope you got you got some access to your portal. Okay. I hope you guys can log in and check your. Uh, Great every single day with my comments and also your production sheet that it's on on the portal as well too okay uh some cdc guidelines how to be protect yourself uh, again don't touching touching your face and washing your hands at all times okay they utilize bleach have to disinfect uh message from miss and derek okay a uh, ton of jobs added to poach jobs daily you gotta create an account upload your resume or use the resume template in the pie middle. If you need assistance, please don't hesitate to contact Ms. Ann Derek. She's awesome. She will work with you guys, okay? Uh, a feature employer, Cork and Barrel, located at 4,000 East Palm Valley in Run Rock, okay? We'll be opening this spring and all uh, hiring all positions. Email your resume and in, in interest to Austin Markman, director of Austin Cork and Barrel Pub.com. If you're interested, you live somewhere within, within Run Rock City Limits, okay? Additional opportunities on Poach Jobs. A uh, new Irish pub is opening soon in downtown Austin. Uh, Austin's Hotel District, they're hiring a chef, a line cook, all back at the house, who have a passion for proper Irish cuisine. We see some of the focus. Foxypropperpub.com uh, is located in uh, 201 Brussels, okay? Apply for Poach Jobs again. Ritual Meals, a postpartum meal delivery service. Focus on organic, locally sourced, everything from scratch soups, stews, plated food, snacks, and teas. Located at 1606 West Stancy Lane, um, Austin Ritual Meals is hiring prep cooks. Regular work gets on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, 13 bucks an hour if anybody's interested, okay? Dry storage again. Uh, right, Mr. J uh, Jamil, uh, <laughs> where we goes? Elijah, right? And uh, they, did you get to talk to Ms., uh, Mr. Stan, Ms. Anika? Um, not yet. I was like, I just finished some more um, paperwork. So I'm just going to give it another day and see if I hear anything. Okay. If not, Elijah can help you out with that one. He's right there every single day. Okay. Right. Yeah, if you need like inside, like if you need to like get directly to him, I right, have his number or shift uh, Raf's number as well. All right, thank you. Quote of the week, there is hope even when your brain tells you there isn't. So I've done my brain is right. It's not working, <laughs> right? Just for- yeah, especially after work. What? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> just for fun due to social distancing only one person is allowed to cry in the walking at a time thank you right right if you work in the restaurant industry you know what i'm talking about correct okay trivia food for thought where were french fries created one belgium two france three ireland four spain or five, England? Belgium. Elijah says Belgium, that's number one. Anybody else, take a shot. Uh, England, maybe? 
England. Ireland. Ireland. I get one, three, and five. Anyone else? Take a while, guess. I'll go with France. France. Belgium, France, Ireland, England. I'm going to choose Spain. Okay. Final answer. Final answer. Let's see what's, where were they created. Belgium, it is correct. French wines were, were uh, actually created in Belgium, not France. Got their name from their French Julien cut. Okay. Remember that Julien cut from foundations? You will need it again during uh, regionals. Trust me. The Belgians are part of their fry related history. Then the entire museum to in Bruges, in Bruges, Belgium, dedicated to fries, it is called the Fritz Museum. And it features two stories of crispy golden history. Visitors can learn about their rich history of potatoes, simple old fashioned fries, and learn the secret of making the perfect French of fries at home. Belgium. Belgium, Belgium, Belgium. That is your news week, uh, newsletter for the week. Okay. All right, uh, let's go over what's happening uh, this week. Okay. So we're at week two. We're going to cover day six and day seven, guys. We're going to be talking about chocolate. Anybody allergic to chocolate? Awesome. Hey, the city, do you all love chocolate? You guys like chocolate? Because we're going to be working with it a lot. Okay. Well, for this week, chocolate. Chocolate, chocolate, right? Just like tag team, right? The commercial. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> Scoop, there it is. All right, guys, come on. <laughs> Anyways, chocolate, okay? A little history of chocolate. I'm not going to bore you a lot. I'm just going to go into a little bit of history of chocolate. Begins in Mesoamerica. Fermented beverages made from chocolate date back to 300 BC. Aztecs, ruthless bastards, man, I swear. Believe that cacao seeds were the gift of Quetzalcoatl, the god of wisdom, and the seeds once had so much value that they were used as a form of currency. That is correct, currency. Cash money, C-notes, red presidents, greenbacks, mula, dinero, pesos, yen, euros. Okay? Originally prepared only as a drink, chocolate was served as a bitter form of liquid mixed with spices and corn puree. It was believed to have aphrodisiac powers and to give the drinker strength. So they such drinks also known as chilate, which are made by locals in the south of Mexico. After its arrival in Europe, 16th century, sugar was added to it, rendering an aphrodisiac, and it became popular throughout society. First among the ruling classes, then among the uh, common people. 20th century, chocolate was considered essential in the ration for the United States soldiers at war, okay? The word chocolate comes from the classic Natal word chocolaté or chocolate. It is the English uh, language from the Spanish language. One of the most popular flavorings, perhaps the most popular for candies, cookies, cakes, and pastries. Chocolate also uh, serves as a beverage and as an ingredient to traditional spicy Mexican mole sauce. Have you guys ever had mole? Yes, sir. I've had mole. How, how does it taste like? Uh, it's kind of like gritty. Uh, I'm not, I'm actually like not really sure how to explain the taste of mole. Mole, it's great. It's got uh, some different spices. It depends what kind of mole, but that one is, uh, it's, uh, the sweet one is from the state of Jalisco. That's where I'm from and also the West Coast. Anyway, so it, huh? Uh, you said uh, it's from Jalisco. Yep. The sweet mole. That's where it comes from. Oaxaca has a lot of different molas too, but they got the red, the green, the orange, purple, blue, and all kinds of different colors. Yeah, I think I've only seen the purple, uh, the brown one. Yeah, brown one is sweet with some pickled red onions. Delicious, man. Chicken or pork. Heard. Anyways, that kind of mole, not mole, mole, mole. Remember Austin Powers? That mole, okay? Uh, anyways, uh, one of the most popular flavorings, okay? Uh, let's go to the next one, okay? History of chocolate. Uh, the Broma cacao food of the gods, 700 AD. Cacao tree originated in South America, carried by the Mayans into what is now Mexico. 
Yusef's wooden currency, 1504, Columbus brought the cacao beans to Spain. The term cacao mispronounced cacao. Uh, it was a potent drink back then. 1525, Spanish conquistadors in Mexico, uh, Cortes planted the bean in islands on his way back to Spain, in Trinidad as well too. Haiti, African islands, Fernando Po, Spain had control of all production uh, for, uh, for 200 years. 1600, chocolate drink appeared in France. And they added sugar, vanilla, and vanilla was added too. And they used La Molina, La Molinette, to mix it. Do you guys know what La Molina looks like? Ever seen one? I'm not sure. It's uh, like a little ball. It's got ridges in it, grooves, and it's got a, a handle, so bad out of wood. Okay. You guys ever watch Dora the Explorer? She always goes back. She always goes saying, bate, bate, chocolate ish, right? Anyways, Molinette in French, Spanish is La Molina. It was preferred hot. It is uh, used to uh, stir the hot cocoa. Okay. 1700s, cocoa factories opened up in Europe. Uh, 1765, Jane Becker, the first in the United States. 1825, Conrad J. Van Houten developed separator, paid the way for all future chocolate candy. 1847, Eight Fine Sons, first eating chocolate. 1875 to 76, Henry Nestle, Daniel Peter, um, also introduced condensed milk and milk powder. 1894, Milton Hershey, milk chocolate bars. Okay. Just FYI, I know we don't cover it, but in Pennsylvania, there is a, a, a huge resort spa. It is a Hershey spa. Anybody loves chocolate, go check out the Hershey spa in Pennsylvania. Hershey PA. You can take a, a exfoliate your skin in chocolate. That's how much chocolate they got. Anywho, 1907, Hershey's Kisses. 1939, Nestle's Chocolate Chips. Okay. Uh, chocolate continue. Chocolate quality is actually the product of several factors of, in addition to flavor. All of the following factors should be evaluated when selecting chocolate. Appearance. Color should be even glossy without any discoloration. Smell. Should smell chocolatey with no off odors or staleness. Break. Should snap cleanly without crumbling. Texture. Should melt quickly and evenly on the tongue. That's a good quality chocolate. Okay. Types of chocolate, unsweetened. Man, that stuff is bitter. I tried one out and I had to spit it out. Pure hardened chocolate liqueur without any added sugar or milk solids. It is frequently used in baking, sometimes referred to as baking chocolate. Unsweetened chocolate is approximately 53% cocoa butter, 47% cocoa solids. Its flavor is pure. Chocolate, but the absence of sugar makes it eventually inedible as is. Like I said, I tasted it. I spit the sucker out like it was nobody's business. Okay. Bittersweet and semi-sweet chocolate contains at least 35% chocolate in the core plus additional cocoa butter, sugar, flavor, and sometimes emulsifiers. Generally, semi-sweet chocolate is sweeter than the bittersweet chocolate, but there are not precise definitions. So flavor and sweetness vary from brand to brand. Both uh, bittersweet and semi-sweet chocolate are excellent eating chocolates and can usually be substituted measuring for uh, measure for measure in any formula. Okay, Coverture, it's expensive. It's expensive, that comes into the five pound blocks, right? Chocolate containing at least 32%, okay? Cocoa butter, professionally chocolatiers generally prefer coverture chocolate, which is, has a higher fluid than other chocolates when melted. That's the one you use to make all kinds of chocolate boxes and all kinds of goodies. Okay. Sweet chocolate, USDA required that it contains no less than 15% chocolate in the core and varying amounts of sugar, milk solids, flavorings, and emulsifiers. This is your chocolate chips, Baker's chocolate. Okay. Milk chocolate, the favorite eating chocolate in the United States. It contains sugar, vanilla, perhaps all the flavorings, and milk solids. Chocolate chips, are drops of chocolate available in count size from 14 to 160 per ounce, okay? Cocoa powder is the brown powder left uh, after the fat is removed from the cocoa beans, does not contain any sweeteners or flavorings and is used primarily in baked goods. There's two kinds of cocoa powder, the regular one, which you guys, uh, the hybrid got, but those will flake up. And then it's the uh, dark 
cocoa powder. When you look at it, it looks like dirt. You mix it with water, it looks like mud. And I tasted it, I'm like, ah, what the heck is this, man? Spit it out too. Cocoa butter, chocolate liqueur is approximately 53% fat, known as cocoa butter. Cocoa butter has a long been, uh, been priced where it's a uh, resistance to rancidity and it's used as a cosmetic, right? And then you got white chocolate. Ivory colored substances is the product of an albino cocoa bean. It's actually a confectioner's product. It does not contain any chocolate solids on the core. So white chocolate is not true chocolate. The finest white chocolate converted sugar contains minimum of 31% cocoa butter, maximum of 55% sugar, 20% milk solids and vanilla and other flavorings, but no uh, cocoa liqueur. Imitation chocolate, yes, there is such a thing. Less expensive products substituted for chocolate in many prepared foods. Imitation chocolate is made with hydrogenated vegetables, oils instead of cocoa butter, as little as 8% deep fatted cocoa powder, as much as 55% sugar, plus emulsifiers, flavorings, and perhaps milk solids. This is your almond bark. You buy at Walmart to make um, almond bark. It is imitation chocolate, okay? Don't ever try to use it for uh, chocolate dipped strawberries or any of the kind of kind of a, uh, recipes, it's mostly just wax, okay? Nutrition chocolate. Chocolate is high in calories and fat, contains minimal amounts of vitamin A and trace amounts of other vitamins as well as some sodium, phosphorus, potassium, and other minerals. And curvature chocolate, curvature flavors, dark, bitter, up to 99% cocoa solids and cocoa butter, bittersweet, 60 to 80% cocoa solids, cocoa butter, sugar, vanilla, Less of fan, semi-sweet, 50 to 60%. Milk, 35% cocoa solids, cocoa butter, sugar, milk, solid, vanilla, less of fan. White, zero cocoa solids, only cocoa butter, milk, sugar, milk, solids, vanilla, and less of fan. Let's finish an emulsifier, okay? Storing chocolate. All chocolate should be stored at a cool, consistent temperature away from strong odors and moisture. Chocolate should never be stored under refrigeration. Dark chocolate, uh, well, white chocolate and cocoa butter can be stored up, can be kept up to one year without loss of flavor. Milk chocolate will not keep as well because it contains milk solids. It'll start getting moldy on the outside, okay? Tempering chocolate, okay? Very crucial. We are going to temper chocolate on Friday. We might temper it tomorrow as well too, okay? In order to create chocolate candies with a high gloss and crispy, sharp snap when eaten, chocolate must be tempered correctly. It will be crumbly and develop gray streaks known as bloom when they dry. Untempered chocolate takes a long time to set in and uh, sticks to candy molds. So remember that, untempered chocolate will stick to candy molds, okay? Tempered chocolate is a controlled process, so melting, cooling, and reheating chocolate. That's right. You're going to melt it, cool it, and reheat it to bring it to that temperature, okay? Uh, what was I, okay? Uh, cool and reheating chocolate with specific temperature ranges. The ideal temperature depends on the type of chocolate and the percent of cocoa butter that it contains. Are, there are several tempering methods, such as seeding, tabling, Microwave oven and cocoa butter methods. We'll be talking about the seating in a few minutes. Each method relies on melting chocolate and heating to a certain temperature, the cooling and rewarming in it. Great care must be taken when tempering chocolate. The chocolate must be chopped into the small uniform pieces so that it melts evenly. Okay. And I will tell you, show you guys how that is done. Okay. Equally important steam or water must not enter the chocolate because this will cause it to seize. So the number one enemy of chocolate is water. Whenever you work with chocolate, make sure all your equipment is clean and dry with no water. If you have water in your bowl where you make the chocolate, it's going to seize up. That chocolate is trashed. Same thing with your spatula spoon. Make sure the spoon or spatula doesn't have any water, okay? Anyway, simple important steam of water must not enter the chocolate because it will seize up. When stirring chocolate during tempering, if excess air is incorporated to the mass of chocolate, it will become thick and unmanageable. Reheating and retempering will restore the chocolate's fluidity. Okay. So remember, no water on the chocolate. It's like holy water, right? Against evil. Okay. Tempering chocolate. Picture on the left hand side. 
It's a properly tempered chocolate. Glossy, hard snaps, just easy, doesn't easily melt. Untempered chocolate, the one on the right hand side of that one, is dull, streak, crumbles, easy, melts easily, okay? So you gotta temper the chocolate properly, okay? Uh, tempering chocolate, you gotta keep this temperatures. If I were you, I'd write them down, guys, okay? You melt the dark uh, semi seed chocolate to 115 degrees in a double boiler. So pot, sauce pot, water, okay? Boil it, stainless steel bowl, and dry it inside, but make sure the bowl doesn't touch the water in the pot. Put your chocolate in it and melt it and check the temperature to 115, okay? 115 degrees. You're gonna take it out, you're gonna seat it to 84 degrees, and I'll show you how to seat it. And you're gonna bring it back to 89 degrees in the double bullet for a few minutes. 89 degrees is the proper temperature to uh, work with tempered chocolate, okay? So Chef, you said, um, you said 84 and then bring it back up to 89? Correct. Okay. So you're gonna melt it to 115, drop it down to 84, away from the heat, and bring it back to 89. That's the ideal temperature you want your chocolate to, okay? Um, handling tips for melting uh, melted chocolate. Double boiler, simmering water, low steam, because too much steam, the water can go inside the chocolate. Stir to complete melting, okay? Slowly, you're not making the mayonnaise or the uh, vinaigrette. Uh, avoid the seizing. Careful of water at the bottom of the bowl. Your workspace, you your workplace needs to be workspace needs to be completely clean. Okay. Air incorporation. Do not use a whisk when tempering chocolate. Use a rubber spatula or a wooden spoon. Preferably rubber spatula. Okay. And again, tempering. You're going to melt uh, the fat crystals, get this all. You're going to introduce the seed. We'll get into that in a minute. You're going to cool it, stir it to recrystallize and rewarm to 80, 89 degrees. Okay. Caution, fat blooms, too much heat, cocoa butter separates, you're gonna have gray streaks, flavor is not compromised. Sugar bloom, introduction to water, sugar crystallizes, uh, you're gonna have whitish spots and a chalky texture, okay? Uh, white temper, candy making, decoration, which we are gonna make some, we're gonna make some filigrees, uh, sculpture boxes, okay? Dark chocolate tempering, okay? So we're, beginning, we're gonna begin with about six ounces of chopped chocolate, okay? We're gonna set aside three ounces. That's the seed, okay? Double boiler, melt the six ounces first, 113, 120, remove from heat, begin stirring the seed. So begin stirring the three ounces you set aside. That's the seed. Begin stirring until the temperature reaches between 86, 89, okay? And the chocolate on the outside should feel cool to the touch. Test before using. Okay, so you got to keep those temperatures in mind. Okay, uh, milk and white chocolate tempering. Same as dark for chocolate, but tempers are lower. Okay, tips are lower. Heat water again to simmer. Turn off the heat uh, before placing a bowl of uh, chocolate in the pan. Use it about 113 to 120 deg uh, degrees for milk chocolate, and 104 to 113 for white chocolate. Seed it. Test with proper temper. Uh, 8046 for milk, 82, 83 for white chocolate, okay? Ganache, we'll be making ganache as well too. Typically a combination of chocolate and heavy cream. Coverture not necessary, so chocolate chips are better for ganache, okay? Butter may, be, may also be added, so when you add the butter, it becomes hard ganache. You've got three kinds of ganache, soft ganache, hard ganache, and white ganache, okay? For candy fillings, many uses as uh, a so sauce, glaze, filling, icing, okay? Melting the chocolate in short smoothness, stir to complete melting, heat cream before adding. So on the side, you're gonna have your measured chocolate chips in a stainless steel bowl. You're gonna scald your heavy cream. You're gonna pour that over your chocolate chips, okay? And stir them until everything's mixed thoroughly. That is your ganache. Wait until it cools out, then you can work with it. Chocolate mousse. We are gonna be making chocolate mousse, okay? There will be some times when I'm gonna tell you guys, do not use the recipe on the portal, okay? This is one of those days. There is chocolate mousse on the menu tomorrow, I believe. Do not use the one on the portal, okay? I'm gonna give you a different recipe in about a second or two. Mousse, many recipes, light, 
airy yet rich dessert made light by addition to whipped cream, egg, egg whites, eggs, uh, yolks, both uh, are can be utilized. Pasteurized egg yolks recommended for service for at-risk population. That means the elderly in nursing homes and or the little ones in kindergarten. Uh, they're gonna follow the uh, pate, pate bomb method. We're not gonna do that, okay? Pasteurized egg whites will not whip up well. So don't ever try to use pasteurized egg whites, always use fresh, okay? Anyways, protein chains after the heat treatment it may take up 30 minutes without COT. COT stands for cream of tartar. Okay. There should have been some in your box today. A little souffle cup that's it. Had COT, I hope. Uh, dark chocolate mousse. Again, the Panabon method is done too. No chocolate over a uh, double boiler. Stir in the butter. Uh, make Panabon. Whip egg yolks until light. Lemon yellow. Make a softball uh, stage into syrup. We'll get into that in a minute, few minutes, okay? Uh, pour the syrup into the yolks while whipping. Slow steam until uh, cool. That is also uh, called the Italian, uh, uh, what you call it, meringue, okay? When you heat up, make a simple syrup, heat it up to a certain degrees, bring it out. You whip it up your egg whites and you slowly drizzle that, that hot syrup into the egg whites, okay? What else? Uh, so this is your chocolate mousse recipe for tomorrow. If I you take a picture with your phone or write it down, whatever you want to do, okay? Again, this is your recipe for tomorrow, guys. This is your recipe for tomorrow. Take a picture of it, chocolate mousse. So um, do you want us to do like the same method it says for the um, recipe on the portal or are you going to just like? I got the method coming up. Okay. You all got the recipe? All right, chef, I got it. Yes, chef. Kevin, Ileana, I know Jake and had it from the last time. Lena, Carlos, Beyonce, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Alejandro, Sergio, Jamar. Amadi, you guys got the rich recipe? Yes. Uh, yes, I have it, Chef. All right. Yeah, I have it, Chef. All right. So this is the recipe, and this is the method. It makes just enough for like about two servings, okay? It is perfect. It is perfect. And it is nice, rich, and fluffy and airy. And all you gotta do is let it sit in the refrigerator so it'll, it'll stay firm, okay? It works really, really, really well, okay? Got it? All right. All right. Your menu tomorrow. You are making pate brise. You are gonna make the mealy, not the flaky, okay? Mealy is when you cut the butter into the flour smaller than pea size, okay? It's on your, on your uh, book on uh, page 962, I believe, okay? You're also gonna make chocolate cream pie, and we'll get to the recipes in a few minutes, and your chocolate mousse, the recipe that I just gave you, okay? Again, chocolate cream pie using the pate brise, okay? Let's see if I have, have you guys ever made a pate brise before? No, sure. Okay. Hey, Chef, I have a quick question. Uh, answer. Um, on the production sheet, I know you said that you want us to uh, have pictures on there. Do you want us to have pictures of just the product in general or, or like our finished product? Uh, just Google an image. I'll show you an, uh, an example of the production sheet. You can Google the an image and insert it into the little box where it says uh, menu, and I'll show you guys how, how it looks like. What I want you guys to do is to start looking at um, how envision how your plate is going to look at the end, okay? Because the big part is not just how to uh, how to make the recipe, but how to present it on the plate, okay? Got it? Okay. Chocolate cream pie, mousse, and pate brise. 
Millie, not Flaky, okay? And for those of you guys, um, if you guys want to follow me tomorrow when we get set up, okay, um, I'll start making it and you guys can follow me or you guys can go alongside with me making that pate brise because I'm going to be making that along with you guys. I'll explain to you guys how. Like, just like I did on Friday. Uh, who was here on Friday? You guys remember watching the video of the uh, pate shoe on Friday? That's the exact same way. Yeah. Okay. Remember how it had to flow? How, uh, I was doing the recipe and I was talking to you guys along the way. That's how it's going to work tomorrow. Okay. Same way. Any questions about this one before we go on further? All right. And then at the end, when we roll the slice, I'll pull up the menus, the recipes. We'll take a look at the recipes. We'll take a look at the production sheet. All right. Okay. So that was uh, tomorrow, okay? Let's take a look at what's coming up next. Six and seven. That was Tuesday. This is Wednesday. Hello, 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 hello. We're making cakes on Wednesday. Hope you guys are ready for your sweet tooth. Okay. We are making cakes, cakes and more cakes. We're making devil's food cake and chiffon cake on Wednesday. Got it? So let's take a look at cakes, okay? Ingredients. The functions of the ingredients on cakes, okay? Uh, tougheners, okay? Uh, your eggs and flour. They're your protein, okay? Also over mixing it, it'll overwork it and you'll make it tougher, okay? Your tenderizers are, are your fats, including the egg yolks, sugar, and chemical leaveners. Do you guys know what a leavener is? Your baking soda, baking powder, and sometimes yeast won't work with those. Those are your leaveners, okay? Uh, moisteners are your liquids, including syrups, sugar, and eggs. Your drier ingredients in your flour, starches, and cocoa. Cocoa powder is a drying agent. You add it to the recipe, it'll take away moisture. Also, your NFDMS. That stands what for is that? non fat dairy milk solids, aka powder milk. I heard, thank you. We got two of those in the dry storage, right, Ms. Elijah? We get powder milk and milk solids. Okay. There you go. Leaveners is your BP and BS. BP, baking powder, and BS for baking soda, not bullshit, okay? Sorry. They give out CO2 and give it a lift to your cakes, okay? Give it a lift to your cakes. Those are your leaveners. When we go into bread baking, your yeast are you going to become your leaveners, okay? Mixing methods. First, your fat, and then your sugar. That is called the creamy method. It works really well for American butter cakes. Two stage, your uh, liquids, sugar content for your carrot cake, okay? One stage, when you put everything together in a mixer, that's for your brownies, so brownies do not have much of a lift. They're like dense and packed, okay? Uh, flour batter, I usually use for wedding cakes and specialty cakes, okay? When you make a nice smooth batter, first you cream the butter, add the sugar, Cream it, add the egg yolks one at a time, cream it, add your uh, dry ingredients, your liquids, you whip it until it's nice and fluffy, okay? The foaming methods, using low fat, uh, high eggs. Your chiffon, it's almost like souffle, okay? Anybody had a souffle before or made a souffle before? No, sir. Okay, that's your souffle method, okay? We're gonna get to that in a minute. Or sponge cake, okay? Sponge cake, whole, or separated eggs, okay? That's for your Genoa cake and angel food cake, okay? Goals for mixing, to combine all the ingredients into a smooth, uniform batter, to form and incorporate air cells into the batter, carefully folding, to develop the proper texture in the finished product. Emulsions. Be aware that many cakes require the emulsion to be formed during mixing. Improper mixing can result in a, in a curler batter, poor texture. 
So be careful when you're when you're on your mixing. Okay, you got a proper mixing technique, right? Uh, ingredients too cold or liquids may be added too fast. Okay. Creamy method for devil's food cake. Okay. Blend the fat and sugar until uh, light and fluffy. So uh, tomorrow, if you guys have an electric mixer, I would suggest use it. If you don't have one of those fancy uh, uh, blend, blend out kitchen egg mixers, a little handheld mixer, old school, with the two little panels on it will work, okay? Because you are going to cream your butter fat first until it's nice, fluffy and airy. You're gonna add your sugar, cream that until it becomes light pale in color, and then slowly add your eggs, blending it each one at a time, okay? And you're gonna alternate sifting, sifting your dry ingredients in it, okay? Combined with your liquid. So dry liquids, dry liquids until everything's in there, okay? Uh, you're gonna scrape down the sides of the bowl and continue mixing, okay? Uh, scale it to prepare pans, or you're gonna, uh, whatever your recipe calls for, maybe spray or grease your pans, put them with sugar, flour, scale, pop the batter inside, and you're gonna pick it in the preheated oven. The chiffon method, that is a little more harder to make, okay? Sift the dry ingredients into a bowl with half the sugar only. Stirring your liquids, including egg yolks and oil. Blend well, okay? Blend well. And then on the side, whip your egg whites until the stiff, moist peaks, and then with the half, uh, add the half the sugar. You're going to carefully fold in your egg whites into your batter okay, in third portion, not all at once, so you're going to deflate it. You're going to scale it to prepare pan, okay? Uh, um, only the mixer, you'll need that to make this cake, this batter, okay? Uh, as far as other equipment, you can, you can get a disposable uh, cake pan, or you can, if you have a cake pan at a house, okay? Uh, sometimes a uh, disposable aluminum uh, pan will work. Okay. What else? Um, you're gonna whip your egg whites on the side with a you know with a, a whisk in a bowl. Okay. Add your sugar. Carefully fold in your ingredients and scale the pan to prepare. Okay. Do not spray the pan. Okay. Uh, do not spray the pan. Uh, Parts of paper on the bottom only. Okay. And I'll be talking about what what, what that means. And uh, bake in the preheated oven. Okay. We're gonna go on those methods real quick. Creamy methods, souffle, it's light as air, okay? Uh, prep ramekins first, so when you make it a souffle, you gotta grease your pans and coat them with sugar, okay? And then uh, you're gonna go ahead and um, prepare the base, whip egg whites uh, into firm moist peaks with part of the sugar, uh, the souffle is sweet, fold in the egg whites with your egg yolks, and then go ahead and pack them in their cup and then put them in, a, in, a, in the oven, okay? So pretty much when you make a souffle, on one bowl, you're gonna have your egg yolks and maybe um, vanilla extract, maybe some sugar, other egg bowls with your egg whites. And then once they're whipped, you're gonna fold them to the egg yolks, uh, pack them into a grease, sugar-coated uh, ramekin, pop it in the oven for about 15 minutes, 350, and it should be done. So when you pack them into the souffle cup, pack them flush against the rim and clean the rim. Because when it bakes, that emulsification is gonna, uh, is going to make the souffle rise to the top. It'll look like Marge Simpson's hair. That's what we want, okay? What else? Cheesecake. It's a cake or a custard. What do you guys think is a cheesecake? Cake or a custard? What can be classified as? I'm going with cake. I've never had a Custard, so I'm gonna say it's a cake. <laughs> cake, actually, uh, cheesecake is a, it's kind of classified as a custard because it's got eggs and, and cream cheese, and you make it into a, in a bain marie in a pan with water in the oven, okay, and it coagulates like a custard. But but there's only there's two kinds of cheesecakes in the United States, two types, not flavoring, but two types of cheesecake. Does anybody know the the two different ones we have here in the states? Is one like baked and one not baked? I don't know. I've made I've made those two cheesecakes before, so it's just a long guess. There's one type of cheesecake that comes to the East Coast. Uh, 
I'll give you a clue. New York cheesecake. New York cheesecake is one type of cheesecake. Why? The regular cheesecake, when you bake it, you, you grab a pan, fill it with water, put in your cheesecake pan inside, aluminum foil, bake it in the oven, right? You take it out, remove the aluminum foil, that top part of the cheesecake is nice and pale. New York cheesecake gets baked the same way with no aluminum foil. So the top crust of the cheesecake becomes golden brown. If your cheesecake is golden brown, it is considered New York style cheesecake. So that's a two types of cheesecake in the States. Just like clam chowder. There's two types of, two types of clam chowder in the States. One we know of, Boston clean chowder, creamy potatoes, right? And the other one is Manhattan clam chowder. It's a broth soup with tomatoes and carrots. But anyway, that's, that's another day's discussion for regionals, okay? Anyways, New York cheesecake has a crust on it. Regular cheesecake does not, okay? So pointers for success when making these cakes, guys. This is this the right day? Yep. Pointers for success when making the, uh, the cakes. Okay, we're making the cheesecake. You're gonna soften the cheese with the paddle, add sugar, and there's no lumps, add eggs slowly, add cream and flavorings, crust should be part baked. Okay, again, crust should be part baked, that graham cracker crust. Uh, and then you're gonna pour the batter into the crust, make it in a water bath. It should jiggle when it's done, not ripple. And again, no color is desired, except in New York City. New York City cheesecake is golden crust, okay? Your menu for Wednesday, it's devil's food cake, okay? And chiffon cake. I uh, forgot to give you guys the, the cake rounds before you guys left, okay? So devil's food cake and chiffon cake. That's what we're making on Wednesday, okay? So let me, let me walk over. First of all, let me go, uh, yeah, let me walk over the devil's chiffon cake, right, guys? I'm going to pop this video in it. I'm going to also share the link with you guys in the chat. So you guys want to watch it later on, but I will upload the uh, links onto the portal as well, too. So you guys have another chance of looking at it later on in time and getting yourself more acclimated with what the technique is. But this is exactly what we're going to do tomorrow, okay? Okay. Think, uh, well, it's 4850. Wild thing. Come on. Right. Come on, commercial. Motorcycle. That's right. Sure, and right. as right. always, whenever I'm cutting. So let's start from the beginning, okay? Here we go. A chiffon cake is a standout cake that's known for its light, airy texture and also because it's super moist. <laughs> Today, I'm super excited to share with you one of the most popular questions that has been asked, and that is all about yellow cake or white cake. Now, we've done so many chocolate recipes, and everybody wants to know, what's the perfect yellow cake? Well, today, I'm going to show you what I believe to be the perfect yellow cake, and that is a chiffon cake, because not only is it nice and airy, but it's also really moist. So I have nine egg whites in the bowl of my mixer here with a whisk attachment, and I'm going to start frothing them up before I add a little bit of cream of tartar. Now this is a half teaspoon of cream of tartar and what cream of tartar does is contributes to the over uh, stability of your egg white foam or in this case it's going to be meringue because we're adding sugar to it. So it adds that strength and structure which will ultimately give you really great volume in your cake. Now a chiffon cake is not a creaming method cake more similar to a sponge cake in which you whip the eggs, in this case I'm whipping egg whites separately from the yolks, to build volume. So while this is whipping, I'm going to add a little bit of flavoring. Since we're making a basic cake, an all-purpose cake, I'm going to use vanilla today. And I really love using a vanilla bean because I think it adds really great flavor. But if you didn't have a vanilla bean, you could certainly use vanilla extract. About two teaspoons of vanilla extract here would give you a very similar flavor. Now, use just the seeds in this mixture. Now, the egg whites, they're doing really nicely here. They're built up. It looks like we have soft seeds. So now I'm going to start adding a little bit of sugar. And egg whites plus sugar 
equals a meringue. So means three quarters of a cup of regular granulated sugar. As always, when you're making a meringue, you want to gradually add the sugar. You know, gradually adding the sugar weight does it helps the sugar dissolve into the egg white so you don't get any gritty texture. I have seven egg yolks here, and to that I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of whole milk and a half a cup of safflower oil or any neutral flavored oil. So mix these ingredients together just until they're nicely combined. And then for the dry ingredients, I have two and a quarter cups of cake flour, three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar, two and a quarter teaspoons of baking powder, and three quarters of a teaspoon of coarse salt. So just mix these ingredients together until they're nicely combined in a large bowl. Now the wet ingredients go right in to the dry ingredients here. Mix these together. So now gradually add a little bit, maybe about a quarter of your egg white mixture into your base batter. And this is the technique of folding. So what you're doing with this initial amount of egg white or meringue is you're lightening the batter up slightly making it easier to then fold in the rest of the egg white without deflating it too much. Now, today I'm using a traditional pan for a chiffon cake, which is one of these 10 inch anodized aluminum tube pans. If you have one that is great, okay? And that one does not get sprayed or grease on the sides of the wall, okay? And I'll, I'll explain why. So this is a typical angel food cake pan. Oftentimes, a lot of recipes will say, oh, you can only bake in this pan because the batter itself needs to crawl up the sides. But I have made this cake in a lot of different baking pans. So you could butter and flour and use a little piece of parchment. A nine inch cake pan, you can use a few of these if you wanted to create a layer cake. So this batter does work. You just need to make sure that you're buttering and flouring so that the batter has something to kind of fall up to or stick on. So make sure your oven is preheated to 325 degrees with the wrap in the middle of the oven. So as always, when you're folding ingredients, you wanna make sure that you're scraping the perimeter of the bowl and then you're bringing the batter up and over on top of itself. So scrape around, up and over, and I'm rotating the bowl as I do this. So this looks nice. Pour it right into your tube pan here. So this goes right into your 325 degree oven for about 52 to 55 minutes, it's going to be nice and puffy and lightly golden brown on top, so right into the oven. So the chiffon cake, it's been out of the oven and it's cooled completely. Now, as with an angel food cake, you want to cool it upside down. So that's why these two pans with the feet on the bottom of them are really great. So you can see it's a nice light golden brown color. It's puffed up really beautifully. And I'm going to take a very thin blade. This is a carving knife. It's flexible. And you want to glide this around the outside of the pan. So to firmly press along the perimeter of the pan here. And you should be able to pop the case right out. Take your knife and go along the bottom of the pan. And with a little bit of a shimmy here, should be able to take the cake out nicely. And so now I'm going to cut this into layers here. So that's your yellow chiffon cake, okay? Like I said, if you have one of those pans, use it. I don't have one. I've got a regular cake pan, so that's what I'm gonna use. Uh, if you don't have a turntable, you can make do without a turntable. If you have one, use it. Um, I do have one that I bought at Walmart a while ago. It's cost me 14, cost me 14 bucks. It's a plastic one. It does the job really well. Um, so if you do have one, a tour table, use it. If you're not, I found some students utilize the top of the microwave base, the wheel, because they're sitting on wheels. So they use that instead of a turntable, okay? Because we're going to decorate that cake on Thursday. That's your uh, chiffon cake. So again, chiffon cake doesn't have to be on that pan. You can use a cake pan, regular cake pan, but you got to use the parchment paper at the bottom, which I'll show you tomorrow how to cut it. And put in the bottom of your uh, uh, put in top of your pie, and then on on Wednesday, how to put in the bottom of your cake pan, okay? And then put the batter with no grease on the rice on the dark sides of the wall, no sugar in the flour, because like I say, you need that cake batter to crawl on the sides of the cake pan, okay? That's your yellow chiffon cake. Those of you guys who are on the hybrid, you're gonna need to take that to campus on Thursday, because we're gonna decorate on Thursday. 
we're going to present it on Friday. Okay, so we're going to make it tomorrow, uh, Wednesday on, on, on at home. And then we're going to take it on Thursday, um, Thursday, uh, assemble it together, and then present it on Friday. Okay, so yellow chiffon cake. Okay, let's take a look at devil's food cake, which is the other item on your menu. Okay. Any thoughts about that uh, devil's I mean, chiffon cake? All right, let's take a look at Devil's Food Cake, all right? Show. And when she puts up a performance like this, we might get to the closing thing. Hey, it's over. Um, now, I didn't mention this before. Make it from the beginning. Hey, everybody, Thomas Joseph here. And today, I'm super excited to share with you another Science Behind. And today's Science Behind is all about Devil's Food Cake. Now, are you one that enjoys a light and airy devil's food cake like this one here? Or do you prefer a dense and fudgy devil's food cake like this one I have here? Well, it's all a matter of ratios of fat to flour. And I'm going to show you how you can customize your cake batter to your taste. So let's get started. So what do I mean by these formulas and playing around with ratios? Well, there are two main components that you need to be worried about, and that is fat and flour. So if you wanted a light and airy cake, like this version here, you can see it has a nice domed top, you need three cups of cake flour and three sticks of butter. But if you are like me and you like a dense fudgy cake, which I have here, which has more of that brownie type top, that crackly top and a fudgy interior, you are going to need more fat. And so I have three and a half sticks of butter and I've added four ounces of bittersweet chocolate that has been melted. So these two items here are the fat component. And then we've reduced the overall flour by a cup. We only need two cups of cake flour. The rest of the ingredients stay the same, regardless of how you make it, light and airy or dense and fudgy. So I'm gonna get started. I have three and a half sticks of butter here in my mixer. So I'm making that dense and fudgy version. Add two and a quarter cups of granulated sugar, cream this together, until it's nice, light, and airy. And that will take about three to four minutes. So while the butter and sugar is creaming together, I am going to take my cocoa powder, which is consistent throughout the two recipes, and it's three quarters of a cup of Dutch processed cocoa. And Dutch processed cocoa is this dark cocoa. It's not natural. Natural is more of a red cocoa. And Dutch processed cocoa is treated with an alkaline solution, which means that it neutralizes the pH of chocolate. Chocolate is naturally acidic, and Dutch process is a neutral pH. So stir this together with three quarters of a cup of hot water until it's nice and combined, and then add three quarters of a cup of sour cream. Now, sour cream is our acidifying agent, which is going to react with our leavener. That creates the air and the volume of the cake. So three quarters of a cup of sour cream, whisk your sour cream into your chocolate mixture here. And now add that melted chocolate. Again, it's four ounces of bittersweet chocolate that's been melted and cooled. Now our butter and sugar mixture is nice and creamed here. It's light and fluffy. Now I'm add the eggs. And that's four large eggs, one at a time. You're gonna add it to the mixer. Your ingredients should be at room temperature. So all of my ingredients here are at room temperature. And one full tablespoon of the best quality vanilla extract that you have. Now, vanilla and chocolate work really well together. Vanilla actually makes things seem as though they're chocolatier than they are. So whenever you're making something with chocolate, add a little bit of vanilla and it amps up that flavor. And now I have two cups of cake flour here and I have one teaspoon of baking soda. Again, that's the leavener. It's gonna react with the sour cream, that acid, and create those bubbles which give rise to your cake. So sift these two together, and now we're ready to put the whole batter together. And one more thing, I almost forgot, half a teaspoon of salt. Remember, salt is very important in baked goods. It brings out the natural flavors. So I'm gonna start with half of our dry ingredients. 
starts on low speed, add all of this chocolate sour cream mixture, and now the rest of the dry ingredients. I'm just finishing stirring the batter together, making sure that it's all evenly incorporated. And now into our baking pans. I have two nine inch round baking pans here that have been buttered, lined with parchment paper, buttered again, and then dusted with cocoa powder. This will ensure that the cakes come out of the pan nice and evenly. So use your judgment here and try and evenly distribute the batter. Now, what I do is uh, do grease the pan, but I coat it with sugar on the outside, even the bottom too. So uh, I, I spray the pan, cut a little piece of parchment paper, set it on the bottom, spray it again, and then coat it with sugar. So when the cake comes out, it comes out nice and clean, not sticking to anything. I don't use cocoa powder. Now we can use this method, um, the cake batter, you can bake it in the sheet tray, okay? Two methods, okay, your choice. Or between the two pans, you could use a scale here to weigh out the batter so that you know that each layer is perfectly even. And now gently smooth out the tops and have your oven preheated to 350 degrees and these cakes will bake for about 40 to 45 minutes. You wanna make sure that a toothpick, when you insert it in the center of the cake, it comes out clean. So when your cakes come out of the oven, make sure you cool them in the pan for about. Yeah, see my uh, turntable that about Walmart kind of looks like this, but it's a little more squattier. Okay, it's so about 14 bucks, give or take. It does a job, okay? About 15. And then we'll go ahead and assemble them on, on, um, on Thursday. Any thoughts about that coming up? on uh, Wednesday. Devil's food cake, chiffon cake, okay. We're making them, but we're not assembling until Thursday, okay. All right, let's take a look at Thursday, okay. Thursday, we're gonna make buttercream icing. We're going to assemble the cakes on Thursday, okay. And it takes a lot of powdered sugar to make the buttercream icing. Oh, yeah. We're gonna get more. Uh, we're gonna get powdered sugar on Thursday on campus. Promise, Elijah. I mean, if I feel like it. <laughs> oh, don't forget, don't forget the condensed milk. <laughs> so buttercream icing on Thursday because we're gonna assemble the cakes Thursday. So it's a three-day process. Okay. Let's take a look at it. Cake icings and frostings. Frosting or icing, often used interchangeably. Okay, uh, filling, coating, or both adds flavor. Sometimes it improves appearance, extends shelf life. Okay, types. You got buttercream. You got foam, fudge, fondant. It is hard to work with. It's like uh, a blanket of this marzipan slash sugar that goes on top of the cake. Glaze, which we're going to make a mirror glaze. I mean, so Jaden has an awesome recipe for mirror glaze. I like this recipe. It's going to be real nice. Uh, royal icing or ganache. Remember that, Mr. The mirror glaze, Mr. Jaden? Okay, he had an awesome mirror glaze. Okay. And or ganache. Okay. So, buttercream icing, light, smooth, and fluffy mixture of sugar and fat. That is correct. A lot of butter, a lot of shortening, and a lot of powdered sugar. It takes about almost a little bit over two pounds of powdered sugar to make one batch of buttercream icing for your chiffon cake. That's how much powdered sugar you can use. Uh, all butter, all shortening, or a combination, we're going to use a combo of both. May contain eggs, okay? May. Yolks, whites, or both. Flavoring, so limitless. You can flavor whatever your little heart desires. Okay, simple Italian and French are most popular. Uh, simple buttercream, also known as American style BC buttercream. Buttercream in 10X, meaning powdered sugar, blended until smooth, light, and fluffy. Shortening saves cost. Why, what do you guys think is that? Anyone on the shortening? Why shortening versus butter? Shortening has a higher smoke point, I guess. <laughs> More flavor? <laughs> no, 
idea. Is what? Does it have more fat? Nope. Shorting is cheap. It's like half the price of butter, sometimes a quarter of the price of butter. Also, shorting, when you eat it, what happens when you eat a little squeak or cupcake that's sitting at Walmart's uh, shelves at room temperature? What kind of uh, what kind of uh, after flavor or, or texture is in the palate? Are you talking about the icing on top? Correct. When you buy the little, it kind of gets like a like a, like I guess a crust or like a I don't know kind of toughness to it when you leave it out or no no it kind of it has a different texture shorting has a different texture oh okay i'm sorry I, I guess i didn't hear you right sorry yeah the texture of shortening what kind of texture is on the palate for medium shortening it's like um a sticky kind of thing like it's like i don't know it's like to me it feels like kind of grainy a bit and it's just like I don't know, a dog with peanut butter, <laughs> you know? That's what I, I don't know, that's what I think. Okay, you're almost on the right track. Um, shortening, at least a waxy texture in the palate, right? Sticks to the back of your, back of your roof of the mouth, right? Because shortening is a hydrogen and oil. Just like peanut butter, it kind of sticks to the roof of your palate, your mouth, right? Shortening does that, butter does not. Because butter is, uh, uh, once it reaches uh, 98 degrees temperature, room temperature, or higher, it starts melting. So when you eat butter, your body's heat disintegrates it. So when you eat something that has shortening, uh, icing with shortening, or icing with butter, the shortening is going to leave a waxy feeling in the back of your palate, back of your mouth. Okay. At least a totally different mouthfeel, shortening. And it's cheap. And it lasts forever. You guys ever watch the movie, uh, what is it, um, Zombieland? When Woody Harrelson was looking for a Twinkie, <laughs> right? That's a good movie. Right? Longest shelf life, right? Twinkies last forever. They don't go bad because of the shortening. The same. Okay. Anyways, flavorings, extracts, chocolate liqueur, most common, egg whites, pasteurized or meringue powder, uh, cream milk or water may be uh, used to adjust the texture. Okay. Italian buttercream, it's a meringue base, soft ball syrup added, butter transforms, soft, light, near rich, most uh, stable the meringue based buttercream. French buttercream, egg yolk base, pate bomb. Again, pate bomb is the uh, simple syrup that is uh, almost to the soft ball stage and is added to the meringue while it's whipping, okay? Butter transforms, light, near rich, Goodies for one or two uh, yolks can be made into whites too, okay? Cakes, so when we layer cakes, use a serrated knife as best, just like you saw him, right? Uh, your bread is serrated knife. You're gonna cut the cake in the middle, okay? You're gonna keep the knife level, okay? And uh, uh, freehand on top of the cake, so your hand's gonna sit on top of the cake. You're gonna use your cake, serrated knife to cut right across, okay? I'm like a uh, hand saw. Gently saw and spin until you reach the center. And I'll show you guys how to cut it, okay? And I will show you guys how to decorate that cake because I know some of us who are uh, uh, perfectionists, if it doesn't come out, we'll spend too much time decorating the cake and we are going to get frustrated with that cake, okay? Always keep icing between spatula and cake. Use the proper motion. Do not dab that cake. So don't pick up icing and put it on top of the cake and try to dab it, okay? Don't dab it. Because if you dab it, you're gonna pick up that cake with your spatula, okay? Uh, use the feathery motion, okay, the feathery motion. This is your spatula with icing, feathery motion on the cake, okay? Feathery motion. And again, if you use the cake wheel, it'll turn. Cake wheels turn, okay? Um, again, we have OC tendencies, uh, take a break, walk away from it, and then come back, okay? Don't sit there and try to smooth it out because you're going to spend too much time on the cake and you're going to get frustrated, okay? So your menu on Thursday, we are assembling, we're making the buttercream icing, okay? We are assembling the chiffon cake, 
and we are going to assemble the devil's food cake utilizing the mirror glaze. Okay, mirror glaze, mirror, mirror on the wall, shovel chestnuts on my pad ish. Okay, so, anyways, mirror glaze on Thursday and American buttercream, mirror glaze on the, on the devil's food cake and the buttercream on your chiffon cake. That's what's happening Thursday. Remember, do not forget, those of you guys on the hybrid, bring your cakes to campus on Thursday. We're going to assemble it in there, okay? Mineral glaze and America, American buttercream on, th on Friday, uh, Thursday. Any questions about that day? A lot of sweet. I, I think I'm going to have to donate my cakes to the homeless on that day, unless somebody wants to take them home on Friday because I can't eat it too much sugar. Okay. I will take it home on Friday. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm not going to be at the school. Never mind. What? I'll take it. <laughs> it, it it's there. I, I can't take it home. So anybody wants it, they can take my cake home. Yeah. Uh, Friday, fruit coolie caramel sauce. We are going to be tempering chocolate and ganache. We're going to make ganache. We're also going to be uh, uh, plating your cakes on Friday. Friday, Friday is when we're going to present our cakes. Okay? Percent. We're going to work a presentation. So we're making the fruit coolie. It's a real easy recipe. Caramel sauce, take a little bit of more, more hard work to it. Um, we're going to temper the chocolate, make filigrees, and we're going to make ganache. Okay? Ganache. Okay, here we go. Friday. Okay? So I used to, uh, that was food cake a while ago. I, I, I really enjoy uh, working uh for Valentine's Day, for Valentine's Day, and going crazy with desserts and menus and food. Okay, is the one time of the year that um, you know uh, you can make money and you can have an exotic uh, food on the menu. Not your loaded baked potato with prime rib and all this. No, no, no. I'm talking about a small, petite, aphrodisiac and exotic food on the menu. So one of the, my favorite recipes that I'm used to do has been the devil's food cake, individual devil's food cake. Okay. So here on the left-hand side, of course, I got the ingredients for ganache because I used to make hard ganache, okay? It's my heavy cream, chocolate chips, and butter, okay? I made the ganache, okay? And then I made my devil's food cake. So I use a sheet tray, parchment paper, devil's food cake batter, baked it off, took it out the next day, okay? Uh, leveled it out on top, okay? And then on top, did a chocolate mousse on top, embedded with brandy cherries, and put another top of devil's food cake, like a sandwich. So I had two sheet threads of devil's food cake, one the base and one the top, okay? Once I had the top, I cut them, punched them out with the cookie cutter, okay? Put them in a wire rack and poured some of the melted chocolate ganache, chocolate ganache on top. And what you see here is the, the right side picture, okay? Individual, Devil's food cake here. Okay, the right side, the right top picture. Okay, so again, sheet cake, devil's food cake, chocolate mousse, cherries, devil's food cake, another layer of ganache, another layer of chocolate mousse, froze it, punched it out, wire rag, poured ganache over it. Okay, and had a little uh, devil's food cake. The trick is the inside is brandy cherries. I used to get them imported from France. They're about 45% proof. And the top here, it's a filigree. We're going to practice making filigree. So I'm going to show you a demo on, on tomorrow, but we're going to practice making them on Friday to decorate your cake. That chocolate is on top is a filigree. Okay. See the, the raspberry coolie on the side and some sliced fruit on the left hand side. That is, I used to call that uh, black forest in French. For it noir. And it used to be delicious, man, because you bite into it. It was fluffy, it's chocolatey, uh, different than just regular chocolate cake with mousse. Okay. And during along the way, I um, I also experimenting making it a duo bottom picture. So I would make the same. Okay. So one regular chocolate, devil's food cake, bake it, cut it, mousse, berries, devil's uh, food cake. Mousse, um, cut it, chocolate ganache. Another one, chiffon cake, white chocolate mousse, chiffon cake, white chocolate mousse, and then white ganache on top of it. So I had two different, two of the same, 
cut them in half, and then my put them together. So I had two, one dark and one white. I used to call it Juliet's weakness for Valentine's Day. Man, it was it's all like hotcakes. It came out the window really, really uh, fast. So that's one way of making the devil's food cake. I'm going to try to do that again. This black for you guys so I can show you. It's not just about a big, gigantic cake, which is fine. You can cut a wedge, but you can also make individual ones, okay? And be more upscale, more gourmet-ish, okay? So that's one way of doing the, um, the uh, devil's food cake, okay? You can either bake it on the cake pan or a sheet tray, either way, okay? And uh, plating onto your cakes on Friday, okay? Let me zoom a little bit, okay? And again, anybody can make a cake look good, but what, what matters is how you present that cake on the plate. Top uh, right, left picture, of course they got Reese's Pieces, but they got whipped a Chantilly pipe on the side, and Reese's Pieces embedded, okay? And the right hand picture is a little uh, chiffon cake, kind of like a strawberry shortcake, okay? Chiffon cake in the middle of the picture. Devil's food cake on the left picture. Plain and simple, classic, okay? So that is on Friday. But again, fruit coulis, caramel sauce, and uh, ganache. So let's take a look at caramel sauce because caramel sauce takes time, okay? Where is it? We're going to look into caramel sauce. Tempering chocolate and making filigrees because we are going to make filigrees on Friday. Okay. There we go. Where is it? Did you know Geico could save you hundred? Let me put this caramel sauce here on the, on the screen. Okay. And again, we're making caramel sauce on Friday, guys. Okay. Scoop, there it is. It's on car insurance and a whole lot more. So what are you waiting for? Hip Hop Group Tag Team to help you plan dessert. So when you make caramel sauce, you guys are gonna need a pastry brush. I just bought a, a, three, a set of three out of Walmart for like a couple of dollars, a pastry brush. Important to have it for uh, caramel sauce. <laughs> You're probably wondering how something made with only one ingredient, well, two really, if you count water, is so difficult to make that it even eludes the most experienced culinary professionals, that is, making caramel. Today, I'm going to show you that it's super easy to make. You only need to know a few tricks along the way, and you'll be making caramel with success every single day. May not be good. To start, I have a cup of granulated sugar. There are a lot of conflicting recipes out there for caramel, and some start with just sugar and no water, and that would be considered a dry caramel. But I really like the method of using a wet caramel. And what that means is that you just add enough water to kind of saturate the sugar granules. It helps the caramel dissolve and cook at a much more even rate, avoiding crystallization and also scorching of your caramel. Once you add your water to your sugar, just swirl the pan around gently. You don't want to use a spoon here or anything else. Just kind of swirl it around until the sugar is saturated with the water. Now I'm going to turn this on a medium heat. You can do a couple things here. If you're cooking your caramel for candies and you need it at a certain stage, then I really suggest that you use one of these candy thermometers where it will tell you when it's at a hard ball stage or a hard crack stage. These are really helpful. Today I'm cooking caramel by color. So I have my sugar syrup over a medium heat and I'm just going to cook this until the sugar granules dissolve into the liquid and it becomes clear, which it's starting to do right now. Now, one trick is to add a little bit of acidity. And I like to do that with just a small squeeze of lemon. The acid really helps in preventing crystallization. Another way to prevent crystallization from forming along the sides of the pan is to use a pastry brush and some water to brush down the sides of the pan if any crystals do form. What I like to do is just to use the lid of the pot. And what that does is caramel is creating steam with heat. The steam collects on the top of the lid. It drips down the sides, so it's constantly brushing.
washing away the crystals that are forming, and it will help your caramel caramelize at an even rate. So this will go for about three to four minutes, and I'll check it every once in a while. So it's been about three, four minutes. You can see that the caramel is just starting to turn color. It's a very pale amber right now. No crystal has been built up around the side just from having the lid on top. A little trick here, most people don't know when their caramel is ready. And an easy way to check that is to take some of your caramel and drop it onto a piece of parchment. And you can really gauge the color of your caramel from that. What happens most times is you look at it in the pot, the pot is darker and it changes the color. It seems as though the caramel is more developed in color and flavor when it's really not. So you can see this needs to go a little bit further to have that really rich caramelized flavor. It's always helpful to have a bowl of ice water on hand because you're dealing with something that's so very hot. If you do get anything on your fingers, you can quickly dip your fingers into the ice water and that will save you a lot of pain. Now this looks great. I'm gonna turn it off and I'm just gonna make a simple caramel sauce for ice cream today. And I'm gonna pour in three quarters of a cup of heavy cream. And you wanna make sure that you turn off your burner here because the added heat will just make this mixture kind of overflow. So do turn the heat off. And then to contrast all of that sweetness from the caramel, a quarter teaspoon of salt. So gently swirl this together. And once it's all combined, let this cool before pouring it over your vanilla ice cream. The caramel sauce has cooled. It's a wonderful, rich, thick consistency, perfect for pouring over ice cream. And so now that you know the simple tricks and tips in making a caramel sauce, so Fred, what do you guys think about that one? Seems not too hard, Chef. No, right? Just gotta take your time. You cannot rush it. You gotta control that heat. Otherwise, it will burn, and it's gonna have a, you're gonna have a hard time cleaning the pot of the burnt the burnt sugar. Okay. Right. Now let's go over tempering chocolate because we're gonna temper chocolate on uh, yeah, Friday yeah. as well too. Okay. Friday we're gonna temper chocolate because we're gonna use it for the um, fill the grease, but also gonna use it for um, tomorrow, I believe. Okay. Tempering chocolate. Here we go. Hey everybody, Thomas Joseph here with another Kitchen Conundrum I know you've been asking about. Have you tried melting chocolate for a candy or cookie project that you're working on and you end up with a dull white sheen on top of your chocolate like this? Well, what this is, is the fat within the cocoa butter, it rises to the surface if it's melted improperly. And today I'm going to show you how to fix that by tempering your chocolate. Tempering chocolate is a really interesting process. And if it has those white streaks in the chocolate, sometimes we turn our, our face and like, eh, that doesn't look good. The chocolate is good. It just has to be tempered properly. Or you buy chocolate in the store to eat and it has those whitest streaks on the chocolate. You may, you may want to throw it away, but it's not. It just hasn't been tempered properly. It says, but slowly bringing chocolate up to a higher temperature, reducing the temperature and cooling the chocolate and then bringing it up again. And what that does is it leaves you with a wonderful shiny chocolate that's perfect for barks, for candies, for dipping cookies in, and it also has a really nice texture. And it's not that hard to do. You just need to know the temperatures for the chocolate that you're using. So today I'm using milk chocolate for my holiday bark. What you need is a pound and a half of chocolate in total. I'm going to show you a tempering method that's called seeding. And you want to make sure when you're melting chocolate for any project that the pieces are uniform in size so that they melt at an even rate. I have one and a quarter pounds of chocolate here, and I need a quarter pound more, but this needs to be left in one big piece. So we need another piece of chocolate that's four ounces, and this is perfect here. So reserve this piece off to the side, and now we're going to melt the chocolate. And for this, I'm using milk chocolate today. I need to bring this up to 113 degrees. So we're gonna take the pound and a quarter of chocolate and I'm going over a pot of simmering water and I've turned off the water because you don't want boiling, you don't want steam. Any moisture that you introduce into your chocolate will make your chocolate seep. So be careful 
not to introduce any moisture here. And what I'm going to do is just gently stir every so often until the chocolate is melted. And I want this mixture to come up to 113 degrees. And that's specific to milk chocolate. Now for bittersweet, it's about 118 degrees. But when you're tempering chocolate, whichever brand you're using, go on their website and see what they recommend for temperatures. The chocolate is completely melted. There are no pieces. And I'm using a digital thermometer here in the middle of the chocolate, avoiding the bottom of the bowl. And I need a temperature of 113. You want to make sure when you're doing this process for any chocolate that you never go over 130 degrees because you will scorch your chocolate. So I'm at 110 right now. I'm going to keep stirring until it reaches 113 degrees. Our chocolate is at 113 degrees. I'm going to take it off the heat onto a towel to catch any of that excess moisture. And now to bring the temperature of the chocolate down, we need it to come down to about 81 degrees for milk chocolate. This is the seating part. Now I'm using. I I'm going to take that quarter pound piece that I had before and I'm going to place it in the bowl, stirring constantly. And what this does is it acts as almost like an ice cube in bringing the temperature of the chocolate down. Now, you don't wanna add chopped chocolate here because what that does is it brings it down too rapidly. This is a nice slow way of doing so. And this method here is called seeding. So yes, Calvo is chopping right. Calvo, the, the big white. And it should be 81 degrees. Not, not chocolate chips. Which it is. So that's great. Now, if you still have a piece of chocolate left, fish that out. So we need it for um, Friday. And now what we have to do is we have to bring this chocolate up again in temperature. So it's 86 to 88 degrees for milk chocolate. And if you were using bittersweet chocolate, it would be 88 to 90 degrees. So I'm gonna turn off my simmering water. I'm gonna place the bowl over the heat and it's gonna up to about 86 degrees. 86 degrees, so that's good. And now, immediately take the bowl off the heat. I like to, again, place it directly on top of a terry cloth towel, something that will absorb the condensation on the outside of the bowl. And now, if you're using this to make a holiday bar, you can be poured into the pan. So that's how to temper chocolate on, uh, on Friday. We are going to need it because we are going to make this right here on Friday, okay? Well, let me get out of this one. We're making a fill degrees on Friday, guys. So fill degrees. So I got to take the tip of the chocolate, chocolate correctly to make fill degrees. And I will show you a demo tomorrow how to make fill degrees, okay? you can do designs we're going to show you a couple of demos on how to make the designs you can even make butterflies as well too but if you only have white chocolate 
So, Ms. Elijah, it's very crucial that we have the uh, cowboy chocolate on our bill for uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, and you might want to have some, uh, too, because I'll show you guys how many of those filigrees. It's going to enhance your cake presentation. Now, if you're, uh -huh. if you're wondering how to make the pastry bag with the parchment paper, I'm also going to show you them on that one. But here it is, how to make the pastry bag with the parchment paper. I'm going to load up this video on the portal, too, so you guys can take a look. Okay. How to make this um, pastry bag with parchment paper utilized with chocolate. Okay. Simple, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, sir. Right? So we're making um, fruit coolies, recipe is simple. We're making caramel sauce, you saw the procedures. We're tempering chocolate, you saw the procedure on how to temper chocolate. Ganache is really easy to make, and we're gonna plate our cakes on Friday, okay? It's all about presentation on Friday. Any thoughts about Friday? All right, let's take a look at the shopping list for you guys that are online. If you guys have not bought your product for uh, for uh, this week, has anybody gone out to the store yet and trying to get your product in the stores? Online students? I'm only going to go hit it after class to see what they what they had. Um, but I know a lot of stores are out of like milk and stuff like that right now. <laughs> Even our storeroom's out of milk. It's so annoying. It's so annoying. Yeah, I went to the store yesterday trying to pick up a couple of things. I was just walking around to see what they had. Oh, man. The brutal section was dismal. The dairy aisle was zero to none. It was non-existent, no milk, uh, heavy cream, none of that stuff. Uh, it was it was pretty bare. Even the, the potato chip aisle were like, what the fuck? Really? Potato chips? Really? That's yeah, yeah. People love their snacks. <laughs> it's not like a needed item, right? <laughs> I'm like, insane chips. The fuck? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. Let's take a look at your shopping list for this week, okay? Week two. Here we go, okay? Shopping list week two. All right, peeps, here we go, okay? Milk, six ounces. Now, you know you're not going to buy just six ounces of milk. We need more than that. Actually, need about 16 ounces to make pastry cream. Go back and take a look at your recipe for pastry cream and identify how much milk you need to make that batch. We need it for the uh, filling for the chocolate cream pie. Okay. Whole eggs, 17, so two dozen. Butter, two pounds. Cream, heavy cream, one quart. Cream cheese is for the uh, uh, mirror glaze. Okay. Five ounces, bananas. Again, I don't really care for bananas. I, I don't put them on the uh, uh, chocolate cream pie. But again, we know we can play with it. I do have some bananas here for my breakfast. Um, strawberries, uh, lemons, raspberries. Uh, if you can find raspberries, fine. Any kind of berries you can find in the store. At, at school, we got strawberries for the fruit cooling. Okay. And leave some for garnishing your cakes too. Okay. Sugar, granulated sugar, cornstarch, vanilla extract salt, powdered sugar. Like I say, you will need those two pounds. I think it's like a little bit over two pounds of sugar, okay? Semi-sweet chocolate, uh, unsweet coconut flakes. I don't really use coconut flakes. You may skip them, don't buy it, don't buy them. you don't have to. I'm not gonna force you to buy them, okay? Uh, bittersweet chocolate, uh, nine ounces. 
all purpose flour, 12, 12 ounces. Baking powder, half an ounce. So just buy a little container of baking powder. And then the last thing for the rest of the block. Aluminum pie tin, one. Vegetable oil, five, uh, five ounces. Okay. Vegetable oil, corn oil, anything besides olive oil or uh, uh, avocado oil is too expensive. Cake flour, okay. Uh, a little more than that. Condensed milk or the mirror glaze. Oh, yeah, gelatin. Uh, gelatin, you will need it for the mirror glaze. For you guys on the hybrid, it wasn't on the list, but we don't need it until Thursday. So it's okay. We'll get it Thursday, okay? I know what's on the list today. It's like, yeah, don't, don't, need, don't need that sort of kind of cara, but we will need it for Thursday. So Thursday, we'll get another bill that will have gelatin sheets, okay? Uh, white chocolate, it'll be there too for the mirror glaze, okay? That is your shopping list for uh, this week, okay? Chef, uh, so, sorry, uh, the Calabres, do we need the Calabres white chocolate or just? The dark uh, white chocolate, regular chocolate. Just, okay, just the dark chocolate. So right. it's okay if we do white chocolate uh, chips. Yes, white chocolate chips or the mirror glaze. All right, then go. So and then, that shopping list? Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's take a look at the menu recipes, right? Chocolate cream pie. That's what I said. Take a look at your recipe before you go shopping because chocolate cream pie here on the screen. Okay. Let me zoom in a little bit. It's too far out. Okay. Chocolate cream pie. First ingredient is half a batch of pastry cream. Okay. Chantilly. 120 grams of chocolate, your semi-sweet chocolate chips, okay? Uh, we're not gonna worry about the, I'm not gonna worry about the coconut, you want it, fine, fine too. You want the bananas, fine too, okay? So let's go back and take a look at the pastry cream, okay? A hunt, a hunt, thousand grams of milk. We're gonna cut that by half, so 500 uh, uh, milliliters of milk, okay? That is, it equals about, uh, what is it? Uh, two cups of milk, just about, give or take. I mean, 100 grams of milk. I mean, 1,000 grams. So if you really want to be technical about it, okay, let's see how much milk we need for a half a batch of pastry cream. So you take 1,000, and if you should know by the non conversion questions, it's 28 grams to an ounce. So you divide about 28, 28, you need 35 grams of milk. That's about a quart of milk, okay? About a quart of milk. Uh, sugar, 250 grams. Egg yolks, 75 grams. Uh, three or four, depending on the eggs. 110 grams of uh, whole eggs. Cornstarch, butter, vanilla extract, and salt. You got everything on your cart to make this happen. The milk, I'm going to get back from today from a hybrid, guys. You got milk, you got sugar, eggs, cornstarch, butter, and vanilla extract. Okay. So that's the chocolate cream pie for tomorrow. Okay. Chocolate mousse, you saw the recipe, right? So the recipe is there, okay? Let's take a look at, uh, where do we go? There was food cake, shortening. Don't worry about the word that says here, emulsified shortening. All shortening is, has emulsified, okay? Butter, sugar, cake flour, which we got, cocoa powder, got salt, uh, baking powder, baking soda, milk, another 500 milligrams of milk, okay? Vanilla extract, eggs, uh, what else? Um, that's for the cakes on, uh, that was food cake on, <laughs> on Wednesday. Yellow chiffon cake, okay? Cake flour, 250 grams, 200 grams of sugar, six of salt, baking powder, oil, egg yolks, Water, vanilla extract, egg whites, sugar, cream of tartar or CO2, uh, CTO, or uh, CO2, I think it's called, it's spelled in a little place, and lemon zest. Okay, that is for your chiffon cake, devil's food cake on Wednesday. Okay, now let's go take a look at uh, thir uh, Thursday, buttercream icing, right? Okay, so if I remember you saying cut that. Uh... Recipe in half, the one with the thousand gram of milk. Is it okay if we make full or? You can make full if you got that much milk. Okay. Yeah. 
Let me take a look at the, where is it? Buttercream icing. Uh, where is it? There we go. American buttercream. 454 grams of butter, 907 grams of powdered sugar. And again, equals to about almost two pounds of powdered sugar. Four grams of vanilla extract. Uh, cream cheese, if we want to make, make a cream cheese, 227, or chocolate, 85 grams of chocolate, okay? And there was a mirror glaze recipe here somewhere, okay? And then I'll have to go to the pastry, um, whatchamacallit, uh, I'll go to the pastry program and pull the mirror uh, glaze recipe from there and share it to you guys by email, okay? Uh, and then, you know, sugar, heavy cream, Lemon for the caramel sauce. You need heavy cream for the ganache and uh, chocolate. Somebody see chocolate. Let me see if I can pull the uh, ganache. Oh, the uh, pâte de brise for the um, pie tomorrow. AP flour, butter, salt, sugar, and ice cold water. Okay. And where is it? Here's the fruit coulis. Okay. Easy. Fruit, sugar, water, lemon juice. Okay. Ganache. Here we go. Chocolate and heavy cream. That is plenty. Okay. You got chocolate, you got heavy cream. So all the recipes are there, guys. So I'm going to go ahead before you guys go shopping, just like we did right now. Pull the recipes, write the um, uh, have the recipe for this, uh, write the ingredients of the not match with shopping list, and make sure you prepare when you go shopping. Okay, you don't need the full recipe. You want to, if you got all the milk, go for it, okay. So that's the, um, those are the recipes. And that's the, uh, what you call it, the, um, the shopping list was online for this week, okay? Now, let me, let me show you what I got for my production sheets, okay? This is what I'm looking for. Hopefully I can get it from you guys. You guys can go ahead and maximize your grade in preparedness, okay? So let me, uh, okay, right here. Chocolate cream pie, okay? This is my production sheet for my chocolate cream pie, guys, okay? As you can see, I have AP flour, 250 grams, butter, coal, I emphasize coal, 205, salt, sugar, ice cold water. Uh, cut the butter into the flour and salt. Um, flaky is pea size, okay? Yeah, it's on the, I'll show you where it is on the portal. Uh, chocolate cream pie, pastry cream, half a batch. Chantilly, half a batch. Chocolate, 120 grams. Coconut, 60 grams. I'm not, I'm going to leave the coconuts. I don't, I don't really care for that. Banana, 120 grams. I'm going to leave not to. Uh, and then the chocolate mousse, there it is. There's the recipe. There is the, um, what you call it, the method. And on the uh, left-hand side picture, somebody was asking me about the pictures. Now, I want to go ahead and put a picture on it because I want to uh, visualize how my product is going to look like when I'm done with it. So you can go back, uh, hit on the little square, go back to the top where it says insert. So here, here I'm going to go here, okay? Little square. I'm going to click insert, scroll down where it says image to the right, image in cell, window will pop open, upload camera, URL, photos, Google Drive, or Google name search. Okay, so Google name search. I'm gonna search for the uh, chocolate cream pie, okay? I'm gonna type in chocolate cream pie, do search, and they get a whole bunch of chocolate cream pies, okay? You can choose whatever you want that is gonna look like your, uh, you want your chocolate cream pie to look like, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna pick this one. I'm gonna pick this little swirly one here on the right hand side just because. Pick it, and then attaches it to the little square. Boom, see? Easy as that, okay? If you wanna play with that, that production sheet like that, okay? So that's for tomorrow, okay? Uh, this is for Wednesday, okay? Here's my recipe for my production sheet for my uh, devil's food cake. Shortening 125, butter, sugar, flour, cocoa powder, baking powder, baking soda. The method, okay? Yellow chiffon cake, the method, okay? 
Okay, there it is. And on the left hand side, and again, I got the pictures attached. Um, I want to the chiffon cake and then what food cake to look like. Okay. So that's my, my production sheet for Wednesday. Okay. Uh, Thursday, buttercream icing. Boom, there it is. Okay. That's my production sheet for buttercream icing. Okay. Uh, yes, it's grams because if you're going to sit there and try to convert it to uh, ounces, you're going to throw out the whole recipe. Okay, so it's very crucial, those of you guys who are uh, cooking tomorrow, to have a scale and weigh everything out, okay? When we're on campus, if you don't have a scale, I have scales in my locker that I can let you guys borrow them, but you got to clean them, return them back when you're done, okay? But you will definitely need a scale in the next couple of days to cook at home, okay? So there's my uh, production sheet for Thursday. Buttercream ice cream, I mean buttercream, <laughs> American style buttercream. Chop and mousse from the recipe I just gave you. And there's my recipe for the mirror glaze, okay? Gelatin powder, okay? Which we are gonna get on Thursday, Elijah. <laughs> 15 grams, cold water, vanilla extract, sweet condensed milk, and white chocolate. That is the recipe for the mirror glaze, okay? So on the left-hand side, here we go. That's, I got my little pictures of how everything to look like, how I envision it, okay? My uh, production sheet for Friday, even though we're just plating, boom, there it is, okay? There's my recipe for tempering chocolate, okay? And again, those temperatures are very crucial. 113, then 79, then 82. Now we know about the seeding uh, method, okay? And then my fruit cooling, there it is. Berries, 400, sugar, 200, water, 80, lemon juice, 30 grams, okay? And there's the method. On the left-hand side, I have how I envision my cakes to look like when I'm done, okay? That is kind of what I'm looking for in your production sheet, guys, okay? That is what I'm kind of looking for. It Very crucial to turn in your production sheets for you guys to maximize your grading point, okay? If you don't turn them, your grades gonna suffer because you didn't, you weren't well well prepared. On campus, on hybrid students, okay. Uh, when we do line up, uh, you're gonna have full uniform: your coat, your hat, your pants, your apron, your non-slip black shoes, your knife kit, and your production sheet. If any of those are missing, you will not be allowed in the kitchen. Okay, you're gonna miss out. Um, and then when, before you guys go in, if you guys uh, were in the hybrid before, you guys know what is expected, right? You got to take the knowledge check, the wellness check on the portal, right? All right, every single day, that's got to be done, okay? So there is your week's production. That is your week's agenda. Those are your videos. If you want to take a look at it later on, I put the link on the chat. But I've also loaded them up on the uh, portal so you guys can go back and refer to them. Those are your menus. That is your uh, knowledge about the flowers, the leaveners, the techniques. Uh, that Those are my production sheets. That is what we expect to do. Um, did I leave anything, anything out? You guys got all that? Yes, sir. You were asking for something about the portal. Oh, production sheets. If you guys know what, if you guys don't know where they are, here's your homepage. Okay, way at the top. Scroll down slowly. Okay, right here it says daily production sheet. There's a link. Click on that one. It's going to pop up this window. Make a copy. I was thinking, hold on. And it's going to open the production sheet spreadsheet, okay? This is what I'm looking for, okay? This spreadsheet, not on a notepad, not on a piece of paper, not on your hand, <laughs> on the spreadsheet. If you do not have a printer, the printers on campus works. I believe that one behind K3 do. If you do not, if you want to handwrite it, but you don't have one, 
I do have extra copies. I'll bring with me to, uh, on Thursday for you guys to take home. Make some more copies if you want. But this is the uh, format that I'm looking for in your production sheets. Okay. Once you fill them in, top left, file, download to your PC, go to the download folder, open them up, label them, just like I did. Okay. If you want to go that route of having them on Google Docs, once you download to your PC, email them to me. Once it's enough, and I can go back and open them. Here on the bottom left, if you guys know how to work with spreadsheets, obviously, you know, you click on the plus sign, okay? And it creates another tab. Go to the sheet number one, okay? Copy and paste. So, uh, row 33, all the way down to row N, uh, N, okay? Highlight it, copy, go back, sheet two, where's 33? There is 33. Or down to N. There you go. Okay. Highlight it. Paste. Boom. Okay. The bottom tab. Right click. Rename. Chocolate cream pie. Day two. Whatever you want to rename it as. Okay. Once you're done, file, save as. I mean, download to your PC. And then you'll be building them day by day. Okay. That's how you build them, and that's how you share with me through Google Doc. So when you go share, bottom top right here, share, here share, click on that little icon, and it'll you can type the name, email that address so you want to share it to. Okay. Any questions? Must have them every single day. Every single day. Okay. It is required. It is part of the operation. If you come to uh, class with any production sheets, you are going to be lost. You're going to slow down yourself and not be as sufficient. Remember, in this industry, in the kitchen, is not how fast you can run like a chicken with the head cut off. It's how well you're organized and how well you can multitask being mentally prepared here. If you're one of those people that operates on chaos, eh, probably not going to work in this in the kitchen, okay? So we're going to try to organize yourself a little bit more, be a little more anal retentive when you do certain things, and be well organized. So come better prepared. Come to class to slay. Be a savage, right? Right? Heard. So I'm going to teach you a new word, okay? Speaking of slaying, okay? I want you to go Google this word, okay? I'm going to put it in the chat. But I'm gonna pronounce it, okay? S O G N E. It is it's pronounced Swanye. It's got a little thing on top of the E. Google it and let me know what uh, it is. What what um, the definition of that word is, okay? Because I'm gonna tell you the opposite. We use that in the slang kitchen, okay? As we use that as a slang word in the kitchens, okay? So Google it, and let me know what it translates to. Anybody got it? What does it mean? The only thing I found is that this, it's a place, uh, it's a county in Norway. Yeah. That's all I found. Care of. Really? To take okay. care of. That word. To take care of what else? That's all I'm saying. Mostly used by Wayne. 
I don't know that word. Fine dining. Oh, these words are huge. <laughs> Just gonna copy and paste it. I miss a, I miss a, I miss a letter. <laughs> oh. I miss a letter. It's been a while since I use it. S O I G N E. Now look at it. <laughs> Not the best in Norway. S O I S O I G N E. Uh, dress very elegantly or well groomed. Correct. So in the kitchen, we use it as a slang word, okay, to uh, make food that is a shit smith. It's the optimum, best of the best, cream of the top, cream of the cream, okay. So we're gonna try our best. To do the best of the best, everything we make is got to be. Is gotta, we're going to shoot without swing it. We make a mistake, we'll correct it, but we got to work to make sure that it's done properly, it's done correctly. Okay. Yep, elegant. You got it, Mr. Elijah. That's what it is. Okay. Swing in. Okay. Now the opposite of that. Okay. The opposite of that word. Yeah, I'm going to show you a video of what the opposite of that word means. Okay. So hold on tight. Okay. You guys ever ever heard the term of uh, in the kitchen being used as um, we use this this term in the kitchen, shoemaker. Never heard of chef. <laughs> the person that just makes a lot of shoe. <laughs> well, back in the early days, shoemakers would uh, be a MacGyver that will pull your shoe together with duct tape. Now we call them Mickey Mousing you. So a shoemaker is somebody that takes corners cut corners and, and does some part quality product. Okay, this is the uh, definition of the kitchen shoemaker, okay? Let me show you, okay? So you guys get better, get uh, to get a better idea of what the, the uh, term shoemaker really means, okay? Come on, come on up, there you go. Swanye. Swanye. <laughs> we have, what? Not in it. It's the other one. Where is it? There we go. This is the one. Shoemaker. 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 Oh my God, where are you even start? It's a cook to. Just can't cook, has no technique, who thinks that they're good at their job. Mm -hmm. A shoemaker means a hack. They, they, they cook terrible food because they have no love for it. Bad attitude, zero skill, dirty fingernails, unorganized station, tongs in the back pocket, unwillingness to learn, starts making recipes of their own without asking the chef. All of these things would be filed under shoemaker. What else? I, I don't know. I assume that the origin of it is that you know people make food. The food is like shoe leather. Fucking shoemaker. Basically, if there is a shortcut, not always the right way to do it, but it'll get it done quickly, then you're kind of shoemaking it. I was a shoemaker, and I even admitted it. I ran out of grape jelly that we made. I was already 45 minutes late and I needed three more tarts. And I totally went and bought some grape jelly. I don't necessarily condone it. And I was kind of embarrassed and I hope nobody noticed. But every once in a while, it comes out and you have to get it done. Shoemaker. Now you know the definition, right? Shoemaker. So we're going to learn the techniques. We're gonna learn how to make it the proper way. And then we are gonna emphasize it once we put it on the plate, okay? Any thoughts about this week's production, menus, recipes, so far, so on? Uh, Chef, I'm worried that I don't have any, uh, like much of the equipment. Uh, is there any way that you'd be able to send out a text or an email to me on like uh, what uh, tools and equipment I need to possibly get? If you can, like I said, I bought a turntable at Walmart, cost me 14 bucks, okay? Um, disposable pastry bags and you got tips in your knife kit. 
you got a serrated knife, a electric mixer, even a handheld one. If you have one, you can borrow one from your friend, families, whatever. Uh, when it's a little old school that grandma had, you know, when you lick the, uh, the paddles with the uh, cookie dough ish. Uh, those I have a student last black who also bought one at Walmart for like under 20 bucks. Just a little one to, to get for the cakes. Um, if you want to go to Goodwill, sometimes people turn in products that they don't really want, they don't know what they have, and you can find great deals at Goodwill. I'm not saying you're going to find it, but sometimes you do. I love to hunt at Goodwill, man. I bought a couple of things there, but again, Walmart is a good place to go to buy a couple of things. Definitely a mixer and uh, a turntable, okay? I think those two things are going to come in handy. Um, as far as anything else, you know, mixing bowls, whisks, uh, pastry brush. Pastry brush, we're going to need it as well, too, okay? So pastry brush, cake, turntable, and then uh, a little mixer. Make your life a lot easier. You can try making it by hand, but it's going to be hard to clean the butter, okay? So tomorrow, okay, tomorrow, let me go back real quick, okay? Uh, those, you guys, you guys were with me last week, right? Some of you guys were online when I did the demo on the Spanish show Friday? Yes, yes, yes. But not everybody, right? Yes, Chef, correct. And not, not everybody, correct? Yes, Chef. I wasn't there. Okay, I'm going to show you tomorrow before we, before we start class, get yourself organized, okay? Miss everything out. By missing everything out, this is what I mean. This is what I did last week, and I shared with you guys who were able to join in on Friday. This is my pad of shoe production, okay? This is my countertop here in my kitchen, Casa de Chef Miguel, okay? So here I got my scale, I got my pastry brush. I have my mix cups with butter, flour, heavy cream, powdered sugar, sugar, salt, and water. Okay, so the first uh, items on the right-hand side, water, salt, butter, sugar, flour, and eggs were from a pat of shoe. The next one, the powdered sugar and heavy cream were from, from my Chantilly. Next one is I got my little bowl and sifter. Oh, you might need to see the two and a sheet tray with parchment paper, and I got my pastry bags with tips, okay? And here on top, uh, above the uh, scale, is my production sheet taped to my countertop, my cabinet, so I can see what I'm doing, okay? So when I say lease everything out for tomorrow, this is what I mean, get yourself ready. Pre-weight everything, measure it out, have it ready to rock and roll. It makes it a lot, lot easier when you do so, okay? So this is my production for the pad of shoe. So I'm last week, Friday, I made little swans with the profit rolls. And I also uh, went and played it a little bit with the yeah, coconut, uh, cocoa powder on the plate, okay, little swans. Uh, my uh, profit rolls, okay, with ganache. See so how nice cleaning plate on the plate. Eclairs, okay. Plated them too, not overcrowded, everything separate, okay. There's my production for last week. Cream puffs here on the bottom left with the cocoa uh, powder heart and two cream puffs dusted with powdered sugar, filled with chantilly. On top is my swans, because I wanted to show you them how to make swans with cocoa powder and a heart. Right hand side is a little square plate with the uh, profit rolls and my eclairs on the bottom right hand side. So at the end of production, what I want you guys to do, okay? Plate everything up. You don't have to have the same kind of plates I do. Whatever plates you guys have will work. Put your product on a plate, take a picture and send it. Uh, tomorrow we're making chocolate cream pie. Yes, we're gonna make the chocolate cream pie. We're gonna make the whole kid caboodle. We're gonna cut it. We're gonna plate it on the plate. You got heavy cream, you got strawberries, garnish it. And I'm gonna show you how to put that um, chocolate cream pie on the plate, okay? So this is what I'm looking for every single day. Have everything measured out, mixed out, organized, ready to rock and roll. And at the end, uh, we're all going to share what we produce through on the screen. So when we're done, send your product through email, all your pictures, your production sheet. I'm going to put them up on the screen. This is what I made. This is what you made. This is what he made. This is what she made. So you can take a look at your classmates, see what they have done. Even on campus, Thursday and Friday, the same thing. It's going to be consistently done throughout the next uh, five weeks. Okay. So again, I can't emphasize enough about being organized, okay? Again, this is my, my uh, mixed items for my parachute right here, the first picture, okay? So this is what I'm looking for, okay? 
when you uh, tomorrow when you log in, you should be well organized and everything should be uh, measured and, and uh, leased out for the chocolate cream pie. From your pastry cream, your eggs, your sugar, vanilla extract, cornstarch. Um, what else? And for your pate brise, your butter, salt, sugar, and flour. Okay. And I'm going to show you a demo on the filigrees tomorrow. Okay. So be ready tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Same deal. Only difference is most of you guys on the hybrid, we're not going to have this luxury of pre measuring everything out before we start. So we all going to start at the same time. Most of you guys online, don't wait. Be ready. Okay. Any, any thoughts about what's coming up this week? Um, no, sure. Those of you guys who had me before, Ms. Amari, you know what, what what's expected. Uh, Mr. Jaden, you went with the motion with me this uh, on this uh, same block, so you know what is expected. You got it down. I know you got it down. So I know you're gonna exceed and succeed, right? Okay. Those of you guys who are brand, yes, you guys who are brand new to this block. I just show you what is expected, what we're gonna do, and how we're gonna tackle every single day's production. Any questions and thoughts and comments? Okay. Your um, knowledge conversion quizzes are open. They close March 19. Most of you guys who were not here on Friday, they are all open. And I'm gonna make this, I, I'm gonna tell you guys again, you take the knowledge conversion quizzes before March 19, all of them, one through six, you will get 10 extra credits just for taking them before they close. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Take them between now and then. You don't have to wait until Friday to take them. You can take them all today if you want. You can take them all this weekend, whenever you want, as long as they're done before March 19th. You get 10 extra credits. Do we tell you if we do one through six or do you, do you already see it? Well, I can go and take a look at it. And I can scan, see who's taking it. Because on Monday, week five, I will uh, send you guys a last warning. Hey, by the way, Ms. Uh, Liana, you're missing four, five, and six. Uh, Ms. Alana, you're missing two, and three, and four, and so forth, so on. Just hypothetically speaking, okay? But they're open. I suggest take them anytime soon before they close, because when they close, SOL, man, we're out of luck. Sorry, out of luck. Any thoughts so far? Questions, comments, concerns, issues. <laughs> Be ready, guys. We're going to play with some sugar this week, right? And chocolate and eggs and flour and all kinds of good things. No thoughts? All right, guys. All good. I was about to say all good here, Chef. All right. Did you guys are more welcome to be dismissed. Go knock on the switch if you have time. Or go shopping for your product. Uh, again, Mr. Uh, Michael, turntable, pastry brush, and what does it say? A scale. If you don't have one, okay. Uh, turntable, pastry brush, scale. And what else? Uh, if you can, uh, the, the, the cardboard bottoms of the cakes. Okay. Is what you need. And whatever the cardboard boxes of a cake, what you said? No, we're going to use them on campus on Thursday. What, what okay. I mean, when we make, uh, make the cakes, we have the, the cardboard round cutouts to be able to handle the cake better. We'll have some on campus on, on, for you guys on Thursday. But those of you guys online, that might be a good idea to take a look at the um, uh, cardboard rounds for the cakes at Walmart. Okay. Pastry brushes, oh, the mixer. Mixer, pastry brushes, turntable. And maybe the, the cardboard rounds for cakes. That's it. Got it? All right, Jeff. All right, guys. Um, see you guys. Um, yeah, mixer, pastry brush, screw table. Yeah, that's it. You got it. Thanks, Jeff. Tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel. Get ready for rock and roll. We're going to have some fun. All right, Jeff. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, sir. Bye, Jeff. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, Jeff.